So, um, thank you very much for coming. Welcome. Uh, we're so happy to have you all here. Um, and so, this event is part of the broader considerations of technology lecture series, which is a uh, lecture series that some peers and I uh, began because we have a growing interest in the societal impact of technology. We feel that technology has so much power for good that if we can guide it correctly, we can bridge this chasm between society, the negative impacts, bridge the chasm between Washington, D.C. and um, the, the developers. And so um, this initiative, Broader Considerations of Technology, is really to engage more of the community, more of the students, more of the general public um, in these discussions to guide technology. And so this initiative is three parts. It's intended to be three parts, which include this lecture series, a newsletter that we'll be coming out with, and then a conference that we hope to um, hold in August of 2019. So uh, with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for coming. Uh, thank you, Professor Waite and Dr. Hassan, for coming to speak. Um, thank you for the organizers uh, for putting this together and our partners, which include the Husker Vote Coalition, Linda Major with the Center for Civic Engagement, uh, Dr. Adam Thompson from the UNL Kutok Ethics Center, and the Computer Science and Engineering Ambassadors Organization. Um, so the format of the event will be, we'll have each speaker speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll move on to moderated questions. There'll be a few questions. Um, the moderator will be Dana Hoppy, and then we'll move on to open question and answer period, where we'll have a microphone and we'll pass that around to you. So um, just some final quick notes. If you could just switch your phones on to silent, that would be great. And then um, you've all been given a feedback form uh, throughout the lecture or after the lecture, if you could just fill that out. Um, it's got a place for um, keeping up with our email list and giving us general feedback. So we'll collect those at the door on your exit. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Matt Waite. Um, Matt Waite is a professor of practice at the College of Journalism and Mass Communication, teaching reporting, web development, and digital product development. He's also a graduate of the college, earning his Bachelor's of Journalism in 1997. Prior to joining the faculty, he was a senior news technologist for the St. Petersburg Times of Florida and the principal developer of the Pulitzer Prize winning PolitiFact. In 2007, he began working as a hybrid journalist programmer, combining reporting experience and web development to create new platforms for journalism. The first platform he developed was PolitiFact a website that fact-checks what politicians say. The site became the first website awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 2009. After PolitiFact, he and the new products development team built journalistic products involving entertainment listings, high school sports, local crime, and real estate. In 2009, he co-founded Hot Type Consulting, a company that builds applications for media outlets. Hot Type has helped launch a major new Nonprofit journalism entity in Texas Tribune and has produced award winning websites uh, for other clients. Today, Professor Waite will be speaking on technology and democratic engagement. Um, let's give it up for Professor Waite. Thank you, Matt. So, this is going to sound weird, but I have to start by apologizing for my appearance. Specifically, my face. It's not often you hear somebody apologize for their face right away, but follow me for a second. Um, I have a really serious problem with scheduling. Like, I'm not good at it. I say yes to a lot of things that I really shouldn't. So, today, I said yes to the career uh, counselor at the College of Journalism. She's having a class, and she wanted people to show up looking like they should look for a job interview, and then she asked me to show up looking like I should not look for a job interview. So right now under my shirt, I have a grossly inappropriate t-shirt on, and I haven't shaved in three, four days, and I haven't seen a barber's chair for a whole good month because any of this is coming. So if I look kind of homeless right now, that's, that's what's going on. Normally I would be a little bit more clean shaven than that. So, 
I want, I'm here today, I'm, I, I sort of want to call this a confessional. I, I've been having a lot of very serious thoughts about work that I'm very, very proud of. And it all was started by a friend of mine who said to me, you realize that we have more and more sophisticated fact-checking going on right now in the media than ever before. And he thanked me for that. He said, you have a lot to do with that. However, it doesn't matter one bit. Nothing seems to matter in this current political climate when it comes to facts. And the more I thought about it, the more I started thinking a little bit more deeply about what we had done when we created PolitiFact. And I realized what it says up there that we brought a pool noodle to a world war. We came for good reasons and came out with what we have today. I can't accept all the blame for what's going on right now. That's a bit overstated. Uh, but I think, I think it was our naivete when we built PolitiFact that uh, we never really quite grasped. So let me tell you a little bit about how it was built. You heard from my background, I was uh, just starting a new job as this hybrid programmer journal. The pitch that I had made to my bosses was, hey, it's 2006, this internet thing is not going away, it's not a fad, we should embrace it. We should take the best work that we do, the investigative journalism that we do, and the investigative journalism that I was doing, which was very, very data heavy. I was getting in just gigabytes of, of public data and analyzing it and producing stories out of that. And I wanted to continue to produce those stories, but I also wanted to produce things that would allow the public to go through that public data and find things that were interesting to them. We are all selfish creatures. We are all interested in the things that we are interested in. It's the same thing that happens anytime you see a weather radar on TV. You immediately look at it and you immediately look at town and you go, is it raining on my yard? Are you interested in that it's raining in Lincoln? Yeah, sure, probably in some abstract way. But if it's raining on your yard, you are now very interested. If it's raining where you're going to be, you're very interested. It's the same with tax data, it's the same with real estate. It's, I'm interested in what's going on broadly, but I also wanna know what's going on in my neighborhood. I wanna know what's going on in my street. I wanna know what's going on there. So, I was working on that. I was building these products to try to engage an audience in discussions of public policy using public data, using the internet. And I got a phone call. I got a phone call from the Washington Bureau Chief at the time, a guy named Bill Adair. And he said, I have this idea of how we can cover politics differently. I think it involves the internet. I think it involves databases. I don't know anything about either one of those things. Have you got a minute? <laughs> And I would say the proverbial cocktail napkin came out, but it was actually a reporter's notebook. And we started sketching this out, and what came out was politifact.com. Um, the idea behind politifact is we were going to call balls and strikes on facts in politics. In fact, the original version of it, the very first version that we designed, was called the campaign referee. And it looked like somebody had blown up a footlocker on a website. Like it had that black and white striped referee kind of view to it. Oh my word, is it ugly? And I'm glad it died in a fire a long time ago. Um, but we were going to say whether or not something was true or not. And because it's politics, we were going to have gradations of truth. We thought pretty early on, if you want capital T truth, the sciences and theology is that way. This is politics. So we had true, mostly true, half true. We originally began it was barely true, but everybody was like, what the hell is that? Um, so we became mostly false, false, and everybody's favorite, pants on fire. In fact, we thought about naming the site pantsonfire.com, but the owner of pantsonfire.com wanted 3,000 bucks for the URL, and my bosses said no. That was 2,000 and seven, and I'm still mad about it. <laughs> I should have been, they should have made that call. They should have made that investment. So we would take a statement from a politician. We would re 
research it, and then we'd come up with a rule. True, mostly true, half true, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then we publish it. We publish it for everybody to see. This is what it looks like today. It's gone through a bunch of different iterations, but here is uh, a pretty typical fact check of the president. Um, the president does not have a very good uh, track record on the truth meter. Um, and here he claims that uh, cities were rioting in California uh, over sanctuary cities. You all heard about the riots in California lately? No? I'm surprised. That's because it didn't happen. It actually had, that had not happened. So that's why he got the pants on fire rating. Typical of journalism, of the data that creates journalism, let's think of this a little bit more abstractly, is you have a headline, you have a byline, you have a publication date, and you have the text. What I call in a lot of presentations to the newsroom, a giant blob of text. If you ever really want to get a reporter whose life work is text to really be on your side, call their work a giant blob of text. But that's what this is down here. What we decided to do, what the, what the innovation behind PolitiFact was, was we took that fact check story, something that pretty much every newspaper in America has done. They always do it around this time. It always gets published on the bottom of 5B in the, in the local section. And the general what pattern had always been well, this campaign says this, this campaign says the other. We'll let the reader decide. Our idea was, no, we're not going to let the reader decide. We're actually going to do the work. We view that as lazy. So we should go ahead and do the work and, and, and make a call. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to take that story and we're going to blow it apart. Because the way that I was thinking at the time, I was thinking much more about data. I was thinking much more about uh, information architecture and structures and how could we leverage the pieces and parts of this to create a greater whole. So what actually you're looking at here is not just a headline, a byline, and, uh, and some body copy. These are all actually fields of data that the, the content management system that I created captures. And every time somebody creates a fact check, they have to add things like, who said it? And their photo. What did they say? Where did they say it? When did they say it? What was the ruling we gave? Now, that doesn't usually happen until later. Who wrote this story down here? Who researched it? Who edited it? What are the subjects? This one is important. We knew from the beginning that we were going to be in a neighborhood where people were going to be angry with whatever we came up with. We were going to bore somebody's ox. They were going to be upset about it. So we wanted to lay out exactly where we got all of this, what our sources were. Originally, I wanted to structure this box the same way that everything else was structured, where every little piece of metadata was actually recorded. I got a lot of pushback from the editors and reporters on that, and they said it would take forever. We just want an open box, and we can just put whatever we want in there. And I lost that fight. I am proud to say that two years ago, they called me up and said, yeah, you were right. We should have done that. So. <clears throat> Nothing like winning a backdoor argument a decade after it happened, right? <laughs> so what we can do with all of this, though, is we can begin to aggregate things. We can begin to use basic database queries. Um, if you have taken any sort of data management class before, these are just simple select all where stories by Lewis Jacobson. Show me all of the stuff by Donald Trump. Show me all of the stuff uh, edited by Katie Sanders. Uh, anything on immigration, anybody who's ever, who's ever done anything on immigration, we can begin to pull those things. And the data actually begins to create a site. Each story is not just an island unto itself. It's not just a piece of data. It is a, an addition to a broader database of truth in American politics. I'm trying to remember what the number of the clip back is up to now, the number of fact checks. I want to say it's, it's approaching 10,000. It's, it's a large, large, large number now. Um, but that was the idea. The problem was we came in with a key assumption, and that was people cared about the truth, that they were offended about being lied to. And what we found out pretty quickly, no. People don't care about the truth. 
They care when the other guy is lying. But if their tribe is lying in the service of their ideology, they don't really care. They're not going to hold their own team accountable. But if the other guy's lying, well, that's just an affront to American democracy. We're all just going, we're all falling down the sewer. Our guy's lying, uh, you know, it's biased. It's not our fault. That was the original sin. We began with the assumption that people cared about the truth. They don't. We also entered into a very different world when we started this. When we started this, we had no idea that Facebook and Twitter were going to become the enormous vectors for political information that they are. In fact, PolitiFact started about five months after Twitter became like the it social network among tech nerds. Twitter went to South by Southwest in March of 2007, um, and suddenly everybody was talking about Twitter, and what, a, what a neat thing it was, and everybody had to get on it. Well, PolitiFact got on Twitter in about September 2007, and the thing that attracted me to it was actually that it had an API. And I could connect Twitter to the content management system so that every time we did a fact check, it went out on Twitter. And 300 people thought that was great. They wanted to join in on that. 300 people, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, when we actually live tweeted a debate with a human voice, it became 3,000 in one night. It went from 300 to 3,000 after the first debate. We did it again. Uh, we were near 10,000 followers after that. I think PolitiFact's up to 630,000 followers today. Um, so in PolitiFact's lifetime, Twitter has become an absolute monster. So the thing that attracted me to, Politif or to Twitter in the first place with PolitiFact is exactly the thing that makes Twitter awful today. I am, unfortunately, a, a, a Twitter addict. I delete it off my phone regularly. I just reinstalled it earlier today because uh, I needed to look up some information about this event so I could get here on time. Um, so uh, I need to delete it tonight or I'm going to waste a bunch of time. But that API has opened up a lot of things. It opened it up so I can tweet out useful, corrective political information, but it's also opened it to, um, it's also opened it to influence operations. So the very same things uh, are being used in wildly different ways and in ways that the Twitter API developers never imagined. They built it so that people could build iPhone apps on top of it and they can, somebody else could build a better iPhone app than they could. And when PolitiFact won the Pulitzer Prize in 2009, it was like painting a target on the website. Suddenly it wasn't just a sort of noisy website off on the side, it had an air of legitimacy. The Pulitzer Committee gave us that seal of approval. So those influence operations, they might be politically motivated, they might be political parties, they might be just interest organizations, they might be sovereign governments. They can aim resources at people who might be interacting with PolitiFact. And it wasn't really until about the 2010 midterms that we started to see organized attempts to tear down PolitiFact's credibility, to start to influence the narrative around individual things, to start to um, amplify positive things about one side uh, and criticize anything negative about them. Um, and we started to see bots. Bots, I sort of want to demystify bots for a second. A Twitter bot that can undermine PolitiFact. I can teach journalism students who have no experience with code at all how to do that in about four class periods. That's all it takes. You're talking about simple logic. You're talking about applying a library. If you have the time, you have a spare email address and you can pull up an API key, you can do it. Here it is. Here's an entire Twitter bot. This one does something pretty benign. It looks at the health department and finds uh, any news about influenza, it just tweets it out and just says, hey, there's news about the flu, it's flu season. But you're talking about a very minimal amount of code necessary to create a Twitter bot. Now multiply this by the tens of thousands. The logic behind this is also stupid simple. You create a list of people you like and you don't like. When PolitiFact tweets something, when PolitiFact posts something, you look, is that person in that list? If they are, 
Um, if, if there are people that we like, and PolitiFact said something positive about them, we can tweet out, yay team, everything's great. If PolitiFact says something critical of that, tens of thousands of bots can swoop in and go, it's biased, it's crap, it's garbage, it's all awful, ignore it. And people who are ideologically aligned with them will say, okay, I'll just ignore that information. So you can scale this into the thousands and suddenly Churchill's expression about how a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth even gets its boots on, we're way past that. We're way, way, way past that. What I believe has gone on in our society, and the reason that this is a problem, is that what we're seeing is the absolute weaponization of cognitive biases. Now, cognitive biases are just mental heuristics. They're shortcuts that our brains take. Some of them are OK. Some of them are terrible. We all have them. We're all guilty. None of us are uh, clear of this. Uh, even people who are firmly aware of them will still fall prey to them. It's just the way our brains work. However, um, PolitiFact triggers a lot of these cognitive biases, ones that um, are making our politics terrible, and ones that a lot of organizations are pushing for short-term political gain, like confirmation bias. Believing only the information that actually goes to what you believe. You hear about um, the division of media and people engaging in only the stuff that they agree with and only watching a single channel. That's confirmation bias. The whole reason the whole fake news thing works is because of confirmation bias. You're going to click on a thing that you agree with. You're going to share a thing you agree with. You may not even read it. You're just going to share it because you agree with it. That's confirmation bias. There's also something called hostile media effects. Hostile media effects is where the more deeply partisan somebody is, they just believe that all media is out to get their side. Two deeply partisan people can look at the exact same story and walk away saying, it's biased against my team. Both of them, whether it is or not. And another one is the backfire effect. So it would be nice to believe that if we could get corrective information out to people that they might back away from those beliefs. They might have to back away from that line of argument. It's not the case. The backfire effect actually shows that they'll retreat. The more deeply held it is, the more corrective information drives them back into it. You actually make people believe the lie more by correcting it. So in some sense, for some people, PolitiFact has made things worse. We built a cognitive bias machine. We built a machine that basically triggers everything that has made politics terrible right now. Confirmation bias, hostile media effects, the backfire effect. And we had no idea any of these things even existed when we started. We built a tool that can take hours, days, weeks to create corrective information. And an army of bots and trolls can tear it down in seconds on Twitter or on Facebook. That's the bottom line. When I look at what I've done, that's the bottom line. A little bit deeper as we look at Daniel Kahneman, and, and who's a Nobel laureate and also uh, a, a pioneer in this whole idea of cognitive biases and, and, and this research, this brain research. Cognitive research talks about system one and system two thinking. System one thinking is generally quick, it's emotional, it's reactionary, it's top of your head, it's, it's, it's fast, and a lot of times it's wrong. Um, system two is your sort of rational, deep, statistical, an analytical side. It's difficult, it's cognitively hard. We've built a system two solution to a system one problem. And when was the last time anybody thought deeply about what was going on on Twitter at 140 characters, or what is it, 240 now? I don't believe there's a technological solution to this. I think part of the problem that Silicon Valley has right now with the spread of disinformation across these platforms is that they have this faith that there is a technological solution to this. I don't believe there is. I believe in the absolutely limitless ability for the human mind to create stupidity, different arguments, uh, di changing the meaning of words, twisting language. Uh, and I don't think computers can keep up with that. I actually have some backup on this. No less than Rene Descartes in 1637 said that artificial intelligence won't work. Descartes argued that 
a machine meant to act like man would not ever be a man because it cannot know God. More broadly spoken, he meant that they can't understand sort of abstract concepts. Things like faith. And he wrote, we can easily conceive of a machine so constructed that it utters words and even utters words that correspond to bodily actions that will cause a change in its organs. Touch it in one spot and it asks, what do you mean? Touch it in another and it cries, that hurts, and so on. But not that such a machine could produce different sequences of words so as to give an appropriately meaningful answer to whatever is said in its presence, which is something that the dullest of men can do. reading that the other day. Somebody told me that it was out there, and I'm like, okay. So I read Descartes' Discourse on the Method, which in a lot of senses, if you ever get the chance to read it, it's out there on the internet, go find it. Um, a lot of it's really horrible. Like, I won't lie to you. Some of it's like, oh, wow. Um, no, that's a bad idea. Um, but I find this to be um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating, that um, We've been thinking about artificial intelligence for a long time, and there's been doubt about it for just that long. And I'm, I'm in the Descartes camp. I think that technologists need to understand philosophy. I think that computer scientists should be made to take philosophy classes. I think computer scientists should be made to take um, cognition classes and, and psychology classes that talk about cognitive biases. I think we all should. but. We're talking about technology here. Um, I encourage my students to take courses in epistemology, in cognitive biases, and things like that. I think you need to understand system one and system two thinking. And I think in doing so, you'll understand that the solution to these problems is a combination of the human mind and technology. We need to use technology to scale the human mind. The world needs more system two thinking. We need to get away from this emotional reactionary stuff. We need to get system two thinking to scale. We need to get people to engage in the difficult thought of, that democracy requires. We take our democracy back from this by engaging both our brains and our technology. And I appreciate your time. Thank you.